建设、富强、民主、文明、和谐、美丽的社会主义现代化强国，努力奋斗。The Communist Party of China held the third plenary session of its 7th Central Committee from June the 6th to the 9th, 1950 in Beijing. The meeting mainly discussed economic issues. This was a clear indication that the party's focus was shifting from revolution to economic development. Across the country, soldiers were replacing their uniforms with workers' overalls. As part of the national economic construction drive, many of them worked on building several new railways, among them the lines from Tianshui to Lanzhou, Tianshui to Chengdu, Chengdu to Chongqing, Yunnan to Guizhou, Guizhou to Guangxi, and Hunan to Guangxi. Liberation had imbued people with a spirit and determination to lay the foundations for a new China. Even as the Chinese people were striving to implement the tasks set by the third plenary session of the 7th CPC Central Committee, on June the 25th, 1950, the Korean War broke out. The conflict escalated after the United States orchestrated a UN Security Council decision to dispatch forces to the front in the name of the United Nations Command. Simultaneously, the U.S. sent its 7th Fleet into the Taiwan Strait. By October, the U.S.-led forces, having crossed the 38th parallel, were approaching the Yalu River, and U.S. aircraft were bombing the Chinese border city of Dandong. China was under direct threat. United Nations Forces Commander-in-Chief Douglas MacArthur declared they would quickly reach the Yalu River and the war would be over by Christmas. On October the 1st and 3rd, DPRK leader Kim Il-sung contacted the Chinese government, requesting military support. From October the 4th to 5th, an enlarged meeting of the political bureau of the CPC Central Committee was held at Zhongnanhai in Beijing. New China was at a critical stage of its recovery. A war would severely disrupt the vital effort to restore the national economy. After careful discussion and repeated deliberation, Mao Zedong and the CPC Central Committee reached a key decision. China would dispatch forces to resist U.S. aggression and aid Korea. It was a preemptive move aimed at deterring further U.S. aggression. On October the 8th, Mao Zedong ordered the formation of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army. He appointed Peng Dehuai as its commander 
and political commissar. During the night of October the 19th, the volunteer army crossed the Yalu River and entered the war. Mao Zedong knew that in 23 years of fighting, his soldiers had already proved their courage. He was confident that the army would advance and defeat its enemies. However, there was a huge imbalance in the capabilities of the two sides. The US military enjoyed air and sea superiority and had mechanized ground forces. The Chinese volunteers, by contrast, had only infantry at their disposal. They had limited artillery, and their weaponry and equipment were outdated. Despite the adversity, the volunteer army fought heroically alongside their Korean brothers. The world would be astonished by their courage and fighting spirit. Between October the 25th, 1950, and June the 10th, the following year, the Chinese and DPRK forces, through a series of successful engagements, steadily pushed the American-led army back. From an initial battle at Yangsu Dong, they fought their way through Unsan, across the Chongchon River, and past Chosin Reservoir. They succeeded in recapturing vast swathes of DPRK territory, all the way from the Yalu and Cumin rivers south to the 38th parallel. Chosin is the largest reservoir in the DPRK. The terrain here is complex and the natural environment is harsh, especially in winter, when the temperature can drop as low as minus 40. On the bitterly cold battlefield, the volunteer army and the US-led forces engaged in fierce fighting. The Chinese troops who fought in the battle had been rushed to the front from East China. Their deployment had been so rapid that they hadn't even had time to pack winter coats. They wore thin uniforms. Their only food was frozen potatoes, and they drank snow and ice from the mountains. Opposing them were the elite US 1st and 7th Infantry Divisions with their far superior equipment. But through a display of tremendous willpower and by making enormous sacrifices, the Chinese volunteers were victorious. In all, more than 13,000 enemy soldiers were either killed or captured. On display at the National Museum of China is a small pile of dirt. It came from a hill that was a major focus of fighting in Korea. The dirt is almost 50% shrapnel. The hill, known as Triangle Hill, is located in Osong San. Its position at a strategic point in the central defense line of the Chinese and Korean forces made it a major focus of US attack. In the course of a month and a half, the U.S. military sent more than 60,000 troops against the Chinese volunteers holding the hill. They deployed 300 cannons, 170 tanks, and 3,000 aircraft in the offensive. An area of just 3.7 square kilometers was bombarded with almost 2 million shells and more than 5,000 bombs. Fujian 
For 43 days, the volunteer army held their position. From their tunnel fortifications, they repulsed 900 attacks, killing more than 25,000 enemy soldiers. The Korean battlefield was in flames, yet the volunteer soldiers kept coming to support the front. At home, ordinary people donated their money to help acquire aircraft and artillery. By the time the donation campaign ended in June 1952, a total of 556 million yuan had been raised, the cost of 3,710 fighter jets. The war produced more than 300,000 heroes. They included volunteers Yang Gunsu, Huang Ji Guang, and Chiu Xiaoyun. Some 6,000 units were also honored. They are true heroes of the Chinese nation. They are the guardians of the nation's security and world peace. They are worthy of the title Most Beloved. Among the heroes who gave their lives was Mao Zedong's son, Mao Anying. Mao Anying was deployed to Korea as part of the volunteer army on October the 19th, 1950. On November the 25th, just 36 days later, he was killed in a US bombing raid. In April 1953, Mao Zedong invited Deng Fang Zhe, the mother of fallen soldier Huang Ji Guang, to Zhongnanhai. The two bereaved parents held each other's hands tightly. Mao Zedong said, you have lost a son, as have I. Their sacrifice was glorious. As their parents, we share in their glory. In 1990, during an inventory of Mao Zedong's personal belongings, a neatly packed box was discovered. It contained two shirts, a pair of socks, a military cap, and a towel. The items had been left behind by Mao Anying. His father had secretly kept them for 26 years. On July the 27th, 1953, the combatants signed an armistice agreement at Panmunjom. The war to resist US aggression and aid Korea was over. Mark Clark, who was Commander-in-Chief of the United Nations Command at the time, later described his frustration in his memoir. He wrote, I gained the unenviable distinction of being the first U.S. Army commander in history to sign an armistice without victory. Peng Du Huai, commander of the Volunteer Army, said, for centuries, the Western aggressors believed that by deploying cannons on the East Coast, they could occupy a country. That era has passed.
the volunteers had fought with great courage. They had been fearless in the face of attack. They had been prepared to sacrifice themselves for the sake of halting the US advance. They had defended New China, safeguarded world peace, and guaranteed the conditions for economic construction to progress at home. The war, which transformed the political landscape of Asia and the international situation post-World War II, is proudly recorded in the history of New China. On June the 21st, 2019, President Xi Jinping visited the Friendship Tower in Pyongyang, erected in honor of the martyrs of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army. President Xi approached the monument slowly, climbed the steps, and laid a wreath. The ribbon reads, the martyrs of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army are immortal. At the start of 1953, People's Daily published a New Year's editorial announcing the launch of China's first five-year plan. The newspaper called on people across the country to work together to industrialize the economy. On June the 15th, 1953, Mao Zedong addressed a meeting of the political bureau of the CPC Central Committee he proposed a general line for what he said would be the coming period of transition. From the founding of the People's Republic of China to the completion of socialist transformation would be a transition period. The CPC's general line and overriding task during this period was, within 10 to 15 years, to achieve industrialization and the socialist transformation of agriculture, manufacturing, and capitalist industry and commerce. And so, the whole country embarked on the three major transformation movements, in combination with socialist industrial construction. Industrialization was identified as a long-term goal for new China, and achieving it as critical for the country's future. On December the 26th, 1953, the Northeast-based Anshan Iron and Steel Company launched three major projects. They were a large steel rolling mill, a seamless steel pipe plant, and the number seven blast furnace. The move marked a turning point in large-scale economic construction, which henceforth would focus on heavy industry. There's a small village in Zunhua County, Hebei province, called Xipu. Before the founding of New China, the farmers here had eked out a tough existence. More than 20 of the village families had been reduced to begging for food. In 1952, a local farmer named Wang Guofan hit upon an idea. In response to the new Cooperative Transformation of Agriculture initiative, he organized the 23 poorest farmers in Xipu village into a new cooperative society. The cooperative owned only a single donkey, and a quarter of its use rights belonged to villagers who were not members. So they named their cooperative the Three Donkey Legs Society. The members' aim was to work together to achieve self-reliance. They scoured the mountains for production materials. Within three years, they had become significantly better off. In the book, The Socialist Upsurge in China's Countryside, Mao Zedong wrote, 
cannot the 600 million poor people build a prosperous and strong socialist nation by their own efforts over the course of a few decades. At the time of the book's publication in January 1956, 80% of China's farmers were members of cooperatives. By the end of 1956, the figure exceeded 96% meaning that agricultural cooperativization had basically been achieved. For the socialist transformation of capitalist industry and commerce, however, a different approach was required. Unlike the socialist transformation of agriculture, a policy of redemption was adopted. Mao Zedong recognized that if the socialist transformation of capitalist industry and commerce was to be successful, China needed to have an understanding of business principles. So, at the end of October 1955, he twice invited representatives of the industrial and commercial community to meetings. He said, our goal is to make our country more developed, wealthier, and stronger. And he went on, by wealthier and stronger, it's with regard to the whole country. the socialist transformation of capitalist industry and commerce was soon gathering momentum. The Wing On department store on Nanjing Road was one of the so-called four great companies of Shanghai. On January the 14th, 1956, the company announced it was entering into a public-private partnership. The company's general manager, Guo Lin Shuang, sang a Cantonese opera piece during the celebration of the change. He said, I may be a lousy performer, but I have a faithful heart. I am expressing my commitment to the socialist road of the CPC. By the end of 1956, the adoption of the public-private partnership model by previously capitalist industrial and commercial enterprises across the country was almost complete. Simultaneously, the wide-scale socialist transformation of the handicrafts industry was underway. Manufacturing workers were gradually being guided onto the road of socialist collectivization. Recognizing that many traditional brands were being affected, Mao Zedong said, our handicrafts industry has many good things. Don't abandon it. Wang Ma Zhe and Zhang Xiaoquan's scissors should keep cutting for 10,000 years. January 1956, with the completion of socialist transformation, China's social and economic structures had undergone fundamental change. Socialist public ownership dominated the economy. A basic socialist economic system had taken root, based on public ownership of the means of production and the principle of distribution according to work done. Hand in hand with the development of a socialist economic system, major headway was being made in the building of a socialist political system. In July 1953, elections were held for deputies to grassroots people's congresses across the country. Voters dressed in their best clothes cheerfully headed to the polling stations. A total of 278,093,100 people cast their ballots, accounting for almost 86% of all eligible voters. Nowhere in the world had a democratic vote on this scale ever been held before. In Beijing, grassroots elections took place in December. A special polling station was set up at the government's headquarters in Zhongnanhai. 
毛泽东主席来参加投票。和毛主席在一起投票的还有朱德副主席、刘少奇副主席、周恩来总理。More than five and a half million deputies were elected to Congresses. At all levels across the country, among them were 1,226 representatives to the National People's Congress. Hangzhou's picturesque West Lake attracts a steady stream of tourists. Nearby, at number 84 Beishan Road, stands a small building. This is a famous landmark in the history of New China. It was here that, from December 1953 to March 1954, Mao Zedong presided over the creation of a historic document. During 77 days and nights, the group wrote the first draft of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, known as the Westlake Draft. After 81 days of extensive discussions and repeated revisions, the draft constitution of the People's Republic of China was officially released for public comment. Shanxi省平顺县举行的第一届、第一次人民代表大会会议，会议上的首要议程就是讨论宪法草案。人民代表李顺达，人民代表申纪兰，他们都联系自己的亲身经历讨论宪法草案。More than 150 million people across the country participated in the debate on the draft constitution. While essentially giving it their support, they submitted more than a million proposed amendments. On September the 15th, 1954, the highly anticipated first session of the First National People's Congress convened in Huairen Hall at Zhongnanhai. Mao Zedong delivered the opening address. The 1954 Constitution established the fundamental nature of the country and the fundamental political system. As New China's first basic law, it determined that socialism and the people's democracy would serve as its guiding principles. It brought China's state and political systems into line with the country's national reality. It also set out comprehensive provisions for its citizens' basic rights and obligations.
the NPC elected Mao Zedong as chairman of the People's Republic of China. Zhu De was elected vice chairman, and Liu Xiaoqi chairman of the standing committee of the NPC. Zhou Enlai was named premier of the state council. With the convening of the First National People's Congress and the adoption of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, the political system of the People's Congress was established. Simultaneously, the system of multi-party cooperation and political consultation led by the CPC was continuing to develop, and the system of regional ethnic autonomy was maturing. The comprehensive implementation of regional ethnic autonomy enhanced the equality, mutual assistance, and solidarity among the country's ethnic groups. In December 1954, the first meeting of the Second National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference was held. The meeting discussed and adopted a new CPPCC charter. The charter established that, as an organization of the People's Democratic United Front, there was a need for the CPPCC to continue to function. Its basic task should be to unite broad sections of the population under the leadership of the Communist Party and promote the development of socialism. By establishing its new economic and political systems and adopting the constitution, China had laid a solid basis for its further development and prosperity. Nineteen fifty six was a significant year. When members of all the country's ethnic groups completed socialist transformation and embarked on the road of building socialism. It rained heavily on National Day that year. From the Tiananmen rostrum, a smiling Mao Zedong waved to the soldiers and people celebrating the festival. Despite the rain, the review of the three forces of the Chinese People's Liberation Army went ahead. The downpour did nothing to dampen the marchers' joy. The spirit of the Chinese nation, after centuries of being battered, was soaring. China was demonstrating her strength through the power of unity. The young people's republic was marching forward in the rain. Yeah. 